Welcome everyone to Connected, your bilingual space. I am talking to you all the way from Santa Cruz, Bolivia in South America. Today I have a new topic and a new guest to introduce to you. I hope you had a great week and you feel ready to enjoy your weekend. I want to remind you that you don't only see us only through the Abia Yellow channel, but also through Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. Today's topic relates three different aspects in life. It relates profession, lifestyle, and talent. I am referring about these three topics uh, relating profession as a way of having an income, lifestyle as a way to always find yourself traveling, and talent as a way of always being able to do your work in different cities, countries, and continents. Do you think it's possible to find a balance between these three aspects? I like to think that it is possible. To talk about this, we are going to meet a friend that has lived in different places in America. He has lived in the USA, in Mexico, and also in Bolivia. His name is Noah Friedman, and we will have the pleasure to meet him after the cut. Do not go anywhere, stay connected. Welcome back, connected people, and as promised, I am already connected with my guest, Noah Friedman. Noah Friedman is a photojournalist that has studied and graduated in the United States. Since then, he has been growing professionally, doing his work abroad in countries like Mexico, Cuba, and Bolivia. I am very interested to know about his journey and to know about his experiences. Noah, welcome to Connected. I'm glad that you had you found the time to spend time with us. Uh, let's go ahead with the first question. I want to know, you studied in the U.S. and you probably had there different opportunities and you had the, the chance to develop your career over there. So my question is, why did you decide to move abroad and work abroad and go to the countries of the South? Um. When I finished studying, it was about, it was the year 2000, and I did begin working for a couple years in New York. Um, but the truth was, it was a time in the United States where it was hard to find um, a lot to get excited about in terms of uh, social movements and social change. Uh, George Bush had just been elected, the Iraq War started in a couple years, September 11th happened. And I think I started seeing in Latin America um, a lot of opportunities for major social change to happen, and that interested me as a journalist to, to go cover and be a part of. Um, and so I returned to Bolivia, where I had studied abroad a couple years before. Um, I figured I would stay for about a year when I moved down to Bolivia in 2004, but it ended up uh, being much longer. I see. And which, from all of your experiences and from uh, what are your personal interests, which topic do you incline for? What is your inspiration? I think, you know, I got into photojournalism after seeing a lot of work by a photographer called uh, Sebastio Salgado, a Brazilian photographer. And for me, he kind of opened up these worlds for me um, of how other people live abroad and how workers live their lives. And it interested me to show that, um, to kind of uncover those social issues and social problems as a journalist and bring those worlds back to uh, American viewers and other public, other publics. Um, and so my inspiration in moving to Bolivia was to yeah, to get underneath some of those, uh, the social movements and social change that was happening in Bolivia and 
show that to an American audience. Uh, I think my parents inspired me a lot. They had been part of the civil rights movement in the U.S. Uh, in the 1960s and uh -huh. 70s. And that um, it was hearing about their experiences and about being involved in something where there's this kind of hope and inspirational change happening was really attractive. And I wasn't finding that in the U.S. Um, so in my work, I try to focus on inspirational stories, hopeful stories, but also kind of uncovering um, social problems. I see. So in order to follow a little bit your path, where exactly did you uh, graduate in the U.S.? I went to Wesleyan University, um, which is just kind of a, a general university, and they didn't have a journalism program, but I studied uh -huh. what's called Latin American Studies which is a combination of kind of history and sociology and language studies about Latin America. Right, but and which I, city were you on exactly? It was in Connecticut, in Middletown, Connecticut. Uh, I see. Okay, so from Connecticut you went to New York. And from New York, where'd you go next? So in New York I was there for three years and I began working as a journalist. I took one or two uh, photojournalism courses for a couple months and then uh -huh. in uh, March of 2004, I moved to Bolivia with a, a grant that was going to uh, fund my work for the first year in Bolivia. And I ended up right. staying in and Bolivia for the next 13 years. Where in Bolivia did you arrive first? I mean, where did so you I move first? La Paz. I moved to La Paz, Bolivia. Okay. All right. And began working on some personal projects, photography projects, and in those two years, 2004 and 2005, there was a lot happening in Bolivia, uh, politically and socially, and I began to work for newspapers, American newspapers and other foreign outlets covering what was happening. Right, there's exactly where I want to go, because I saw that you have worked with the actual president, uh, Evo Morales. So, coming all the way from from US and New York and then all these different places and then ending up, I mean, have you ever thought you were going to work for the president of Bolivia? <laughs> no, it's certainly nothing I expected. Um, I did, you know, I when I was an undergraduate in college, I studied in Bolivia for a semester in 1998. And at that time, I got really interested in the conflict in the Chapare and issues about coca versus cocaine and I interviewed Evo a couple times and met him back in 1998 and I definitely back kind then. of put it aside mm -hmm. in my brain that it was there was a union movement in the Chapara that was really interesting to me um, and I kind of followed it from afar for many years so in 2004 right. and five, when I moved to Bolivia I was following a lot of the marches that were happening, um, covering them for newspapers, and meeting a lot of people from the Chapare who worked with Evo. Um, and I ended up, so when he ran for president in the summer of 2005, when he announced his candidacy, uh, I began following them on the campaign trail, uh, taking photographs for the New York Times and for kind of European uh, magazines and I got the chance a couple times to travel with Evo in his small plane where he was visiting really small villages uh, and campaigning out in the countryside and we got to know each other and were comfortable with each other and they took me along often but yes I certainly never expected that once he was president that I would be any way involved. <laughs> Right, and let me t uh, let me ask you another thing. How, so, when you came to Bolivia, you already were fluent in Spanish. Pretty much, I spoke pretty well. Uh, I definitely got well, better. Well, I'm sure that's a powerful tool, like in order to come here and be able to manage yourself in the way that you did. Yeah, got folks who knew other folks, um, and inclu you know, so I was able to within a couple weeks or a couple months feel comfortable and. Um, I started studying Quechua. I didn't learn oh, that wow. much of it, but it helped a little. <laughs> That's great. And uh, okay, so let's go back to the whole working with the president uh, experience. Is there any anecdote, any story that you could share with us? Um, yeah, I mean, he, when, 
let me think about the best anecdote. Um, I'm sure you had a bunch, but just yes, one for thanks. us to kind of like to know it. Right. Um, I think what one of the most kind of fascinating and um, exciting times was the first trip that I took abroad with him in May of 2006. Uh, he took a trip to Belgium and France and a couple other European countries. Uh, and so about eight of us traveled over there with him and it was this moment where the world was still kind of getting to know Evo. You know, he had, they had nationalized the gas on May 1st uh, and so, you know, which had made a big impact abroad uh, in the news and, and here we are, you know, in France meeting with the president and uh, in Belgium talking to the European Parliament and there was this sudden interest in Bolivia. You know, I had been in Bolivia for a couple of years and it was always hard to get foreign um, news media interested in what happened in Bolivia. But with Evo, a lot of that came. And Bolivia all of a sudden had this image and um, places began recognizing and talking about Bolivia. And it was, it was really interesting to see that up close uh, and the way that Evo kind of represented the country abroad. It was definitely a big change in the history of Bolivia, for sure. So now let's go um, from Bolivia, which is here in the South, South America. Uh, and also know that you work in Cuba and it's completely two different territories, different history, different everything. Tell us a little bit about your work in Cuba. What do you do there? Um, so, yes, about two years ago, uh, or three years ago, when Obama, President Obama started announcing uh, jointly with Raul Castro a kind of opening of relations, I decided that I would like to spend more time there and report on what was happening. Um, I've always found Cuba to be a really fascinating place. It's It has some in common with Bolivia in that there's it's a couple of places where there's less U.S. influence. Um, you go to other parts of Latin America, Mexico, El Salvador, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. has a lot of influence. And it's always been interesting to me to be in places like Bolivia and Cuba that have their really own identity. Um, and Cuba certainly is kind of like nowhere else. So I went there, yeah, a couple of years ago, starting to cover similar to the news, but also kind of longer stories about social issues. Uh, and of course, that all kind of culminated when Obama came for his first visit to Havana in March, uh, two years ago in 2016. And again, it was a moment similar to what I saw in Bolivia when all of a sudden a country goes through this big change uh, and to be able to watch people um, feel that and ha have hope for the future is a really interesting thing to, to cover. Um, right. And I guess in Cuba, the most interesting anecdote and thing that I've covered was uh, a year and a half ago when Fidel Castro died. Um, you know, he had been out of the spotlight, the public spotlight for many years. But, you know, when he died, there was still this overwhelming sense of grief across the country uh, and people were really affected by it, which I was slightly surprised by because he had been you know, for eight or nine years, kind of out of public view. Um, right. And, and people, and very sick and very old, but people still seemed shocked that he had died. I think people in Cuba think of him as, thought of him as kind of immortal and uh, never really uh, were ready for him to pass away. And right. so they, when he died, they did a caravan with his body, his ashes that they took from one um, from Havana all the way back to the eastern part of the country Santiago where he began um, uh -huh. the revolution movement. and it was just this three or four day um, trip where they slowly drove through small towns and big cities along the highway and Cubans lined up along the roads for three or four days from early in the morning to late at night just to have a glimpse of his car going by and to wave goodbye for one last time. And it was um, really emotional and fascinating. Wow, I imagine. 
I can only, only imagine. And now, how do you manage to be, to find yourself, like put yourself on those moments, like right the moment when it happens for the president or actually this super famous like Fidel Castro uh, passes away. How do you manage to be on the right place? What do you do? Do you have a crystal ball or something? <laughs> a lot of the time it's good luck or bad luck. I've missed other times where I wanted to be at the place. Um, I had actually, many journalists for many years have been anticipating that when Fidel Castro died it would be a very big story. Um, and didn't want to miss it. I actually had been there earlier that week and I had left Cuba. So I was in Peru on the morning that he passed away. And I woke up at oh. five in the morning and I saw on my phone, a couple people had texted me that Fidel had died. And I ran yeah. out of bed. I tried to find the next flight out of the town that I was in so that I could get to Havana later that day. Um, and I got very lucky that I was able to get there um, by that right. afternoon. Because as you said, you were noon. meant to be, you were meant to be there, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Noah, I, I love listening to your stories. Um, we're gonna go to a really fast cut, and when we come back, we're gonna have the last question for you. People at okay. home, stay connected. We'll be right back. <laughs> everyone and we are gonna go ahead and do the last question to Noah. Noah, since you're always in the middle of what's happening and knowing the latest um, news, um, as what happened last week, I want you to tell us you participated on Goni's trial, right? The last, um, the ex-president of Bolivia. Mm -hmm. And I think this happened about 10 days ago. Can you please tell us your experience there? Yeah, I mean, as with other things, it started a very long time ago. Um, when I first got to Bolivia, it was 2004. Uh, and the year before, there had been uh, a lot of violence and a, a massacre in El Alto. Um, and I spent a lot of time with survivors of what had happened in El Alto. And um, during those years, there was a lot of talk about how can you find justice uh, when something like that happens because uh, Goni had fled Bolivia and was in the U.S. and so it was hard to prosecute him in Bolivia or to touch him because uh, he's both powerful and wealthy. Um, and so during those years I took a lot of photographs in El Alto of some of the victims of October uh, and also got to know some lawyers who were trying to think up ways that they could eventually find justice for some of the victims. And one idea was to go to the U.S. courts since he had fled to the U.S. and sue him um, for what he had done in Bolivia. And the truth is, I don't think most of us ever thought it would be successful. I think it was important to try uh, so that he wasn't, so that he, you know, couldn't get away with things and um, impunity is a big issue but um, people worked very hard on it for about 10 years and I've been close with some of the lawyers on the case Rogelio Maita and Thomas Becker and uh, so a few months ago you know the judge gave the final order to say okay there's enough evidence here we're going to hear this trial uh, and it was the first time it would be the first time that a living president former president would sit for a human rights yes. trial in the US. So, you know, right. I kind of filed away in my brain and I said I would really like to be there. Um, and luckily it was not too far. It was held in Florida, not too far from Cuba. So I uh, flew there about halfway through the, it was really interesting. I got to, um, you know, some of the court case is boring, but I was able to spend a lot of time with the eight families from El Alto who were here, uh, who have made it their, you know, oh, life's wow. work. 15 years to to bring this to trial and watching them you know is another inspirational moment where they have against all odds uh, they are mostly you know poor people from El Alto who have very few uh, resources and they're going up against this millionaire uh, in court and they right. were able to 
get it to court, which is a historic thing. And as I said, I think I got there assuming that they had already done, they had already had their victory. Like just by getting him to court was a victory and I didn't expect them to win. Um, and I was able to be there the day, the final day when the, um, the jury, the jurado, ended their deliberations, mm -hmm. read this verdict. And so we're sitting there in this room with the eight uh, family members who lost with, um, husbands and wives and kids. Uh, and on the other side, people from Goni's family. They were there. Mm -hmm. They're sitting there in the room, very tense. They had waited. The trial had ended a week before. So they had spent an entire week waiting for what the jury would say and what they would decide. Uh, and it they were very anxious and it was very nerve wracking. Um, and so they're finally sitting there and the judge, the, the jury hands like a piece of paper to the judge and he reads it to himself for a couple minutes and we're all sitting there in anticipation because we don't know what it says. Uh, and he read it out and he, you know, read out that the jury had found unanimously that uh, Goni was in fact liable and responsible for the deaths of their family members. And it was, yeah, one of the most emotional things I've ever seen uh, to see them I after. Can. It was really a very important date and all of these people's history and especially, as you said, having putting the end of that suffering and of the rage by knowing that all of these crimes, you know, were not being like paid for. And um, it's so important that you've been there and I'm sure you being there and I'm sure a lot of people know you here in Bolivia and I'm sure just knowing that you were there, it kind of gives you the sense that also you were too. You know, because it's very, a very important day. And I am very glad that you were there. And I am also very glad for the work that you do and for the love that you have for our country. Uh, also for all of the work that you do. I wanna be thank you, I wanna thank you for the time spent with us. And is there any blog or any uh, website that you would like to share with us where our, our audience could find your pictures? Yeah, I have a website. It's just noahfr.com, and I'm also on Instagram. Um, and so, kind of my recent work I put up on Instagram, and my handle there is noahfrpix, P I X, at the end. All right, Noah, perfect. Uh, I'll give you a little space so you can just greet and say hi to the people in Bolivia, and I hope you and I stay connected. Okay, great. Thank you, Fabiana. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody in Bolivia. Uh, I hope you're staying connected and I hope you enjoy this interview. Thank you, Noah. Bye. Thanks, Fabiana. Bye. Also, after listening to Noah, it's clear to find out that all of the possibilities and all of the surprises that life are gonna bring us are not always at home. Some people we know they're very happy uh, studying and developing their lives and you know uh, becoming better in their professions where they studied or where they were born. But some other people have the need to just go uh, abroad and find a little more or maybe connect more with the with the with people's story or maybe with the story of other other governments or other countries so if you anywhere in your being if you have this urn of trying to of wanting to know about others or feeling more inspired about somewhere else I will definitely encourage you to go there and find out. For instance, um, Noah came to Bolivia finding for having more uh, interests with the people that he was more alike with, the way they think. He found that in Bolivia, he came here and all of a sudden he ended up being having the experience of working really closely with the president of this country that really says something. Sometimes we think that, oh, I just have an idea and I shouldn't go forward, it's just a dream. But you never know what that dream, which door that dream is gonna open for you. So I'll definitely encourage you that go for your dreams and always try to planify and see the bigger aspect or the bigger perspective about your life.
I'm gonna see you in seven days again and I want to remind you if you know anybody that is doing something great with their lives or has a project on their own that is helping people or themselves please send me an email and let let them be here my email address is conectadosbolivia24 at gmail.com i'll be glad to connect with you i will see you again in one week have a great day bye bye